Hey everybody, my name is Matthew Pose and this is Pose Acoustics. So I wanna talk about waveforming a little bit because I'm gonna be putting it into the room, but it's not a simple process for me. So waveforming is currently in the beta phase. It will be getting released in an initial form fairly soon. The way they're rolling it out is sort of beta to restricted projects to whole market. And the reason is that they just wanna get a sense of what it takes to support this by seeing how it goes with experienced installers, with solid projects. They know they're gonna to have to be very involved and they just don't have the manpower to support everybody that wants to do it. But let me go over the basics that I can tell you. So waveforming needs to have at least four subwoofers. And what that really means, to be clear, this is two subwoofers, but this is one in terms of waveforming because it's only really one location. Now, if I stack these floor to ceiling and I did it on the other side, I would think differently. But in terms of waveforming, it would be kind of hard for it to use the distance between these, given how low they are, to be of any benefit. What you'd really want to do is move the bottom one up, have another gap about as big as this, and then have the next one. So like one would be here, gap, another one up there and you don't really want it in the corner. It doesn't mean it can't work. It just means the results are probably gonna be fairly compromised and you're gonna lose a lot of the benefits, at least some of the benefits. So where does it need to go? In, about here actually. Now, I've done the measurement, so here and up there. On the back wall, it's the same thing. Two is the minimum. Middle of the wall is where they should be. It will work still if they're above or below. In fact, if you have four in the corners, it will give you a result, and it probably would be an improvement over nothing at all, but the result would be compromised over what the system is capable of. So that's the thing to keep in mind. So I've, I've, I built the wall not knowing that waveforming was gonna come out the way it did. I didn't have enough details to understand, and I built this, I also didn't know I was getting these. These are the RTJ 18s for those that are not familiar. Um, and so I have to redo this wall. Like I have to really redo this wall. Um, I have talked to a carpenter and a friend, and I've talked to Peter Ilet as well, who is a partner at Officina Acoustica, about some options. Basically, I need a whole new baffle wall. This one cannot work. It's not even modifiable to work. So what we're going to do is cut out the old one. It's sort of built into the room, so the only way to start over is to cut it out. And then I haven't figured out what I'm going to do yet, but something's going to be done that's going to provide a new baffle wall. It's going to have to be the same width in all likelihood because I have a door over there and there's just nothing I can do about the door. So we're going to cut out the baffle wall. We're going to put in a new baffle wall. And when we put in the new baffle wall, we're going to do it in such a way that I can put the subwoofers where they go. But there's no way I can do that quickly, including, as you know, I only just finished this like maybe six months ago. And so the idea that I would take something I finished six months ago and spent money on and then rip it all apart because I have to get waveforming is a little crazy. So what I'm going to do on a temporary basis is I'm going to hook up the other two RTJ 18s I have on the other side of the room. And then I've got the dual 12 RBHs in the back wall. And I'm going to see what happens. In fact, it seems that Trinov would, is curious what will happen too, because it's not an ideal location, but you can see I have some benefits, like the acoustic center is actually right here, and that's exactly where the bottom woofer should go in a four sub array in the front. And it's not all that far off from where it should be if I had two. I mean, if it was just two, they should be kind of here, and I'm gonna be down there more. Well, what if I was to put these on a stand? Jeff actually makes a stand. It's basically an empty enclosure. What if I get that stand, and I put the stand down, and I put this on top of the stand, and now I've moved it up, that height so that my acoustic center is not here, it's up here. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. So the back would be a problem still. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's good enough. Maybe the decay rate is still controlled very, very well. Maybe most of the front seats are still good. The back seats are not bad. Who knows? So I'm going to make sure I have permission to do it first, but during this beta testing, I'm hoping to share with you guys the results, show you what I do for setups, try different layouts. We may ultimately find that this Trinov waveforming can work in way more practical layouts than was thought. There will be, I'm sure, compromises, but here's the thing. When they say there are compromises, they're not saying, oh, well, it's a bad compromise compared to what you could have done if you used a different approach for corner subwoofers. They're saying it's a big compromise 
relative to what you could have done had you put them in the right location for waveforming, which leads to basically near perfection, like almost no variance between seats. The base is basically dead, flat, smooth at every location. So it's, it's not as good, it's compromised compared to that. Well, it's really hard to achieve that in as large and wide of an area as waveforming does with four corner subs and even something like MSO. It just tends to not be quite that perfect. You can get very good results, but not that. And something like MSO or the Welty approach, uh, which is what Harman adopted as uh, sound field management, SFM, that can't really have any effect on the decay rate. You can't vary the decay rate. The best you can do is get rid of any kind of ringing, which is done through the EQ and the evening out of the response. This can actually reduce the decay rate and it's, it's adjustable. So you can choose how wet or dry you want the bass to be. So it's completely possible that a compromised bad waveforming setup is still as good as something like sound field management with the ability to still adjust the wetness or dryness of the bass in a way that's adequate. You know, it's like you'll look at that and say, you know, I, I'd live with that. I'm okay with that. I can't show you graphs and show you what that would look like yet because I don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these on sliders because they're really, really heavy and it's the only way we're going to move them around. And that way I can try moving them in different locations and see what happens. We may ultimately find you could stick them on like the sidewalls here, way out of the way, and maybe I'll do two here on the sidewalls and two in the back on the, on the back walls or something and get amazing results. It shouldn't work, but again, sometimes you get surprising results with, with this. So that's what's going on there. For those of you that are completely shocked that I'm going to rip the wall out, trust me, I am too. I don't want to do it, but at the end of the day, I want to be able to show people sound field management. I want myself to know how to do it so that I can put it in for other people. I, I actually, before I mess up the wall, I want to test some different iterations because I'd like to know the range of placements that work. So that if you come to me and you say, I want to turn off processor, I want to do waveforming, but I'm, I'm just not sure it's going to work. I'm really worried that my room, I can't put them where they need to go and it's going to be a waste of money. And then I can say to you, it's not. Here, we've tested this. Here's what the results look like. We can do your room even with these compromised sublocations and get a better sense of like, well, just how much compromise are we talking about? So I'm excited. I think this is going to be pretty neat. I think you're going to find it interesting as I start to get results in. Um, I probably, since it's in beta, I probably can't show you the software side of it yet. I'll ask if I can get permission to do that. And if I can, I will show you what the software side looks like. But if not, it's not that fancy or exciting. <laughs> like it's not, if I show it to you, you'll be like, all right some settings, but the results, of course, what you really care about. And what we're going to focus on is just how flat and smooth is it at every seat. So it's not, I don't really care. I can, I already have a dead smooth response at the main listening position and it's pretty close at the left and the right. The back seats kind of suck. Um, what I, what I want to see is can I get that same thing and better in the front row and get the back row to suck less. And one of the reasons why the back row sucks, in case you're curious, is it's pushed up against the back wall. So I've actually pushed it forward some, but we're still talking the heads are only 18 inches maybe, uh, half a meter, something like that, from the back wall. So it's some, somewhere between 18 and 24 inches from the back wall, that's, that's it. And there's a lot of base buildup because it's a really solid room. So even though there's a lot of compliance and everything, you're still talking about more mass than normal. And as a result of that, there is significant bass buildup in the back. And so it's like, it's really bassy. It measures differently. The response is not real rocky. I mean, everything I did, did create a result that's pretty good. But what it did also do is the bass level's about four to six dB hotter in the back than it is in the front because of that bass buildup. So I'm really hoping waveforming kills that and gets rid of that. All right, well, that's what's going on with waveforming. Hopefully you found this interesting. And uh, until next time.